Hi, hello, how are you? Craig Chapman here and welcome to a new video series on experimenting with neural network simulation or more succinctly with AI. Now I have done some AI experimentation in the past quite a long time ago and I've wanted to get back to it for some time. Unfortunately, time being the issue, uh, I haven't gotten around to it. And so with a little R&R &R time coming up in the near future, I decided now would be a good opportunity and why not share my experimentation with you? So this little video series is going to be my attempt to build an artificial neural network simulation. Uh, and to get started, I'm going to go over some very basic uh, fundamental understandings of how neural networks work. For the uninitiated, stick around. If you're already aware of this stuff, then uh, you probably won't get much from my video series. This is going to be very, very basic beginner stuff. And so with that, let's get started. Well, first of all, when I talk about neural networks, what I'm actually talking about is artificial neural networks or a simulation of a neural network. A real neural network is something like what's in your head, your brain, or the brain of an animal or an insect. These are all real world neural networks. Before we can build a simulation of a neural network, we need to know a little bit about how real neural networks function. And so what I have here is a hideously crude diagram of a neuron, something that you would find uh, several billion of in your brain. Uh, effectively you have a cell body, this is just a cell of the body, so uh, this is the bulk of the cell which is called a neuron, and within that you have a nucleus, so that's as with every other cell in the body, the nucleus of the cell. We have an axon which is effectively the output of this neuron, and we have dendrites, which are effectively the inputs to this neuron. Now, the axon I've drawn here as a single output line. Uh, in most biological diagrams, you would see uh, dendra coming off of the end of the axon. And uh, these would be referred to as, I guess, um, axial terminals or something, terminal bulbs, something like that. Uh, not really overly important for what we're going to be doing with our simulation, so I left those out. What's important here is that we have a single output, which is our axon, and multiple inputs, which are dendrites. And I'm sure when I think back to biology class that we refer to the, uh, the receptors on the end of the dendrites as dendral synapses, and that we refer to the transmitter, if you like, on the end of the axon as the axial synapses. Now, I don't know how uh, accurate that is. My memory is a little off on this. But for the sake of simulating the neuron, that's what I'm going to call those endpoints. Now, those endpoints of the cell are usually separated if there are, for example, two neurons. They're usually separated by a gap, and that gap is called the synapse, which is why I have the axial synapse receptor and the dendral synapse receptor. So that gap is the synapse. When you hear of people saying of the synapse is firing, it's actually a little gap between the axon and the dendrites of two or more neurons. And so effectively what happens in the brain is signals are received by these dendrites from other neurons or other sensitive uh, sensor cells, such as the optic nerve cells, for example. Uh, so those outputs are brought into the neural network through these dendrites on neurons. And then some biological function takes place which causes the neuron to generate a signal which it sends out through the axon. Uh, and that mystical function we'll come back to and discuss later. Uh, but effectively the inputs are summed up and uh, an output generated whether it's a firing neuron or a, uh, sorry, a firing axon or not firing axon. For our simulation of a neuron, we can simplify the diagram a little. So I have here our neuron, so that is the cell body of the neuron, if you like. And within that, we have the nucleus. Now, the nucleus of our neuron, we're going to call a perceptron. And basically, this is a simple function that's going to decide based on the inputs what should be output from this uh, neuron. So we have several inputs. These are our dendrites coming in, our inputs to our neuron, and we have an output, which is our axon. Now, each of these inputs is effectively going to be given a numeric value. Since this is a simulation, we're going to push, push in simulated data. So we have uh, three values here. For input 0, or I0, we have 0 0.345, 
for I1 we have 0 0.234 and for I2 we have 0 0.521. So what will happen inside this perceptron is those values that go in are going to go through some function in the perceptron and then an output will be generated on the axon. Part of the calculation is a weighting system. So effectively each of these inputs has a weight associated with it. So we have W0 through W2 in this case and those weights will be multiplied against the inputs and then all of the inputs will be summed up. The dot product will be summed up within the neuron function. Many neural network simulations also carry a bias value which I'm just going to place here on the diagram for now and we'll leave it there. We're going to come back and examine what the bias is about a little later on. And so let's calculate what our neuron is going to do. Well, the first thing we do is we multiply the input zero with the weight zero and get its uh, result. We then add that to the input one and the weight one summation, uh, multiplication. And then we multiply I2 by W2 and add that to our summation. And the result will be above or below some threshold value. So effectively, if we have a result above our threshold, then our axon will fire as true, an output of one. And if it's below that threshold, then it will fire out a zero. It will, be, uh, it will not fire, rather. So we can sum this equation down a little, uh, shorten this down a little by using sigma. So sigma n is the product or the sum of uh, i n multiplied by w n. And if we bring that down a little more, we can simplify it to simply the dot product of i w. So if i w is greater than the threshold, then we get a fire. Otherwise, we do not. Now the bias we're going to bring back in here. So we have the dot product of IW plus our bias value. If the bias brings uh, the product of IW above zero, then we have a one, we fire true. And if it does not, then we have a zero. So this gives us uh, a very Boolean uh, neuron using the perceptron here. So let's do the calculations here. And if you run through the numbers, you will find that our resulting value is negative 0 0.00023, it's less than zero, and so in this scenario our neuron would not fire. If, however, we alter the weight of W0, then what will happen is, uh, I'm going to alter it by a very small value, 0 0 0 uh, 0 0.0007, uh, and run the calculation again, and what we find is that we get a value above zero, so we output a one. That's a difference of 1.0 on the result from the previous uh, calculation. This is not good for learning. And the reason this is not good for learning is if we have multiple neurons connected to each other, a very small change to the weighting on this neuron is going to cause a dramatic change from 0 to 1 in the output, which means a dramatic change to the input of the next neuron in this network. And so this could alter the entire result of the network for a very, very small uh, change in weighting. And so when we have a perceptron neuron like this, what we have is effectively a step function going from zero to one. And zero is a very harsh cutoff. Uh, that, that threshold is a very harsh point to be cutting off. And so what we could do with really to make this learning a little bit, uh, to make it more possible to teach this network uh, is a function. And the function that we're going to use is this sigmoid function. So uh, sig of t is 1 over 1 plus the exponent of negative t, where in our case t is the dot product of iw less the bias value. So the full equation here will be 1 over 1 plus the experiment exponent of negative dot product of iw minus the bias. Okay, so if we now change the center of our neuron from being a perceptron with a P to a sigmoid, that's using our little sigmoid uh, function there, then the output with the original values for this neuron is 2.00022. If we alter that weight in exactly the same way, a 0 0.0007 value, then our result is 1.9999863 which is a difference of only 0 0.00024.1526. It's a very, very small difference in our output. 
which means that by adjusting the weights of the inputs on these neurons, we can very gradually adjust what the uh, neuron will do, how it will behave and perform within our neural network. So let's take a look at how a neural network will be built. Typically we divide uh, neural networks in simulations into layers, and I'm going to come back and explain why that is in just a moment. But effectively we'll have an input layer which will take the input data. So this uh, in a real neural network would be, for example, the uh, optic nerves coming in to these neurons. Uh, in a artificial neural network such as ours, this is going to be, uh, let's say, the values of the uh, pixels in a grayscale image, something like that coming in. And then that input is pushed through our uh, sigmoid function and we get an output. Now the output is fed into a hidden layer and every single uh, element in that hidden layer, every single neuron, is wired to every single uh, element in the input layer and is also wired to every uh, neuron in the output layer. So let's take a, a look at an example. We can see here that all of the input layer uh, neurons are wired into the first neuron in the hidden layer as well as the second and the third. And the same is true on the output. All of the neurons are wired into the output neuron. So by adjusting the weights of each of those interconnections between the neurons, we can adjust the output of each neuron towards our intended output. So in order to train this neural network, what we would do is we would put some input on the input lines. We would run through, process through the functions and get an output. And then based on the output and how different that output is from the desired output in our training set, we go back and we adjust the weights of the connections between each of the neurons. So in this case, let's just refer to them as the synaptic weights. So we go back and we adjust the synaptic weights and that will adjust what the network will do when given that same input again. And it should adjust it, of course, in the direction of the correct output. Now I said that I was going to describe why we break these neural, uh, neural networks down into layers. In a real neural network, uh, real neurons are in a living organism. The brain is constantly functioning. It's constantly doing something. It's effectively uh, an electrochemical process, so it's continuous. Uh, and so each of the neurons is running in parallel. All of the neurons in, in the brain are running all the time based on the inputs. They're generating outputs all the time. In computing, however, uh, if we take away the fact that we have multi-threading and multi-cores for a moment, what you have is sequential processing only. You feed in a list of instructions and that instructions uh, set is executed in sequence, one instruction after the next. Now sure we have uh, multi-threading and multiple cores, however let's just suppose for a moment that each core is a single neuron or is processing the work of a single neuron, then even with 16 cores you can only simulate 16 neurons at a time. And biological brains have in the order of hundreds of millions to billions of neurons. So there is just no way with current hardware to simulate that number of neurons and certainly not have that number of neurons running in parallel. So what we do instead is we utilize the fact that we have multiple cores and multi-threading and so we give, uh, we process each layer in sequence but within each layer the neurons can be processed by individual threads. So effectively in the input layer, for example, we could have four threads running, one for each of the neurons. In the hidden layer, three threads will pick up the three hidden layer neurons. And in the output layer, we have a single thread uh, in this particular example. Now that means that we can create far more complex networks than the one that you're looking at on screen. In fact, the one on screen wouldn't be particularly useful for much. Uh, and so we're going to create more uh, complex networks. This is just for uh, diagramming purposes. We have such a simple network here. So in order to make the multi-threading function, we're going to break the uh, neural network down into layers. Now let's go into a little bit more detail about why that is. If you think about the input to each of the neurons, its value is actually the output of some other neuron. And that output value, if you, uh, let's just think about this in terms of writing classes, for example, uh, that output is a variable somewhere in memory. It's just uh, a value stored at some location in RAM. So multiple threads on the vast majority of hardware uh, 
uh, can read from the same memory location at the same time because all of those threads accessing the address bus at the same time would get the same value from, uh, sorry, accessing the data bus would get the same value from the data bus. However, what it is not possible to do is to have multiple neurons writing to the same variable at the same time because as one neuron tries to write one value, another neuron is trying to write a different value and on an electrical level you have a clash right there on the bus. So in the vast majority of uh, computer hardware this remains true. There are some uh, exceptions to the rule because of caching and various uh, hardware tricks with the buses but effectively we can consider the vast majority of Intel hardware at least uh, to allow us to read from the same memory location in multiple uh, threads but we can't write to the same location. So what we have to do is run the input layer first and each of its neurons will output a value to an individual location. So the first neuron is going to output to location 1, the second to location 2 and so on. When we then run the hidden layer all three of those neurons can fetch the values from the uh, outputs of the first four neurons all at the same time because that's just a read operation but they then place each of their values in location one, location two, location three and then in the output layer it can read all three if you have multiple neurons in the output layer each of them can read all three of the input values from the hidden layer so this is why we separate into layers we can actually utilize the multi-threading capabilities of our CPU to run each layer independently but we couldn't use it to run all of the network at once. Okay in the next video we'll start up opening our IDE and start building some of the data structures that we'll use to represent uh, a neural network.